Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Meet the Candidates event for the 20th Congressional District, August 23rd primary. Both candidates are present. This event was organized in partnership with the League of Women Voters of Albany, Schenectady, and Saratoga counties. My name is Linda McKenney, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County, and I will be the moderator today. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer political organization dedicated to the informed and responsible participation of citizens in government. The League never supports or opposes any political party or candidate. That has been League policy since 1920. Membership is open to anyone who is eligible to register and vote, whether male or female please consider joining your local league if you're not already a member. Before I start, I want to remind the candidates in our audience that the video taken tonight is the property of the league and can only be used by the league or licensed media according to FCC regulations. This event will be posted in it, its entirety. It may not be used by the candidates except to post a link to the complete video. We do not make this request lightly. We have had recent experiences with candidates or their supporters have used portions of our video or an audience member's own video against their opponent. The League is a nonpartisan organization and use of the video by a campaign specifically against another candidate goes against our purpose. Additionally, this behavior would discredit us with candidates, making it difficult for us to sponsor future forums. All candidates participating in this evening and this afternoon have pledged that they will abide by our policy. I asked them how they wish to be addressed and they both agreed that first names are fine. The questions were sent to us by members of the community. League members reviewed and compiled them to be representative and to avoid redundancy. We have rejected any questions of a personal nature. Candidates, this is your opportunity to let voters know your stance on these topics and how you will address the issues facing Congressional District 20. Please don't waste valuable time tearing down or labeling your opponent. Deal with the facts. In your closing statements, absolutely no zingers. No putting your opponent on the spot with no chance to reply. We have timers for this evening, this afternoon's event. Cards will be held up for the candidates to glance at. Green means they have one minute left. Yellow means 30 seconds left and red means time is up. The two candidates in alphabetical order by last name are Rastis Lawar and Paul Tonko. Now it is time to hear their two minute opening statements. They have drawn lots to determine the order. Rastisov, you're first to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanna thank the League of Women Voters uh, for organizing this event. I'd like to thank Representative Tonko for being here. Thank you, Representative. This election is happening in the capital region of upstate New York, a part of this country that most Americans have probably never even heard of. However, all Americans should pay attention. This is because my opponent, Representative Paul Tonko, is the chair of the Subcommittee on the Environment and Climate Change. In this position, he is expected to be the national leader in stopping this existential crisis. Unfortunately, Mr. Tonko has not been that leader. While the homes of Floridians were being overwhelmed by powerful storm surges and the homes of Californians were being destroyed by unprecedented wildfires, and the people in Mr. Tonko's own district looked up at the sky to see those beautiful sunsets, only to realize that they were the ashes of our Western neighbors. Mr. Tonko, what were you doing during that time from a policy perspective? You were busy taking fossil fuel trips down to West Virginia, funded by the fossil fuel, fuel industry. You were busy calling oil lobbyists, your friends, and publicly stating, and there's a video of this on YouTube, that you are responsive to their needs. You were busy becoming the only Democrat in New York State not to sponsor the Off Fossil Fuels Act. You were busy introducing a bill that amongst other provision had a provision that would 
give tax breaks to waste incinerators. You were busy accepting over $100,000 from the fossil fuel industry, while at the same time voting against the Green New Deal on three separate occasions. That is your record. Mr. Tonko, you have failed to be the leader on climate that this country needed at a time when we needed you most. And now, respectfully, it is time for you to let the next generation of climate leaders clean up the mess which we have inherited. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rostislav and Paul, you're next. Thank you, and to everyone watching, I hope you're okay and managing well these days. I hope you're taking time for yourself and your families. I know it's not easy, but thank you to the League of Women Voters for holding this event and to Mr. Rahr for agreeing to participate. We've been through a lot, haven't we? A pandemic, an armed insurrection, the end of Roe v. Wade, the end of a legitimate Supreme Court, Donald Trump, a Republican party that continues to obstruct relief on constant mass shootings, climate change, voting rights, policy, uh, police reform, and so much more. I wake up each morning with these issues and how they affect the people in the capital region on my mind. I am proud of the progress we have made since Democrats took back the House in 2018 and since President Biden has been sworn in. Historic investments in the battle against climate change, bringing jobs from China to the capital region, standing up for our veterans suffering from toxic exposures, the most significant gun safety reform in 30 years, historic job growth, bringing our nation out of Trump's mishandling of COVID, the first black woman on the Supreme Court, historic infrastructure investments, building upon the success of the Affordable Care Act, often called Obamacare. These don't just happen by accident. They happen when we elect progressives who know how to get things done. We here in the capital region, progressives, constituents have gotten it this far because we have worked. It hasn't been by accident. We've rolled up our sleeves, put in the work, and notched victory after victory in the face of relentless political games from the right. I believe I am best suited to continue this fight alongside you. And that's why I humbly ask for your support again on August 23rd. And with that, I thank the League again for the opportunity to share thoughts this, uh, in this forum that are important to our constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Can I use the red card? You can use the red card for only during the questioning. Okay. The question to add something, to, to ask a question about a question or to add something to that you say and you've run out of time. Got it. So now it's time for the questions. And uh, candidates, you will each have a minute and a half to respond to the questions. You're not required to respond. You may pass if you wish. And again, you'll have two opportunities during the question and answer session to request an additional one minute to add to your responses or to respond to something the other candidate has said. Just hold up your hand and say red card and I will acknowledge your request. And the red cards, again, they can't be used during the opening and closing. The timers and I will keep track of the number of red cards used. And the questions will be alternately directed to the candidates. So now we're going to switch up and Paul will go first and Rostislav will go second and then we'll keep, we'll reverse back and forth. So let's see. I have this. So here is the first question and I will repeat the question each time for the second person. Okay, are you both ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. First question, climate change is a huge threat to the world's population. What solutions would you support to make a significant difference? Well, a lot of solutions. I'll put my record up against any. Uh, we reined in the super polluting HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons that are 20 times more potent than CO2. We've uh, in, done a floating solar energy array that now is used as a model for the Army Corps of Engineers. We've had uh, a push to undo the ban of President Trump to do offshore uh, wind in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. 
We've done an energy R&D bill for wind that will enable more efficiency to be uh, the outcome of that uh, form of renewable. We've done an energy act of 2020 that include a, a reauthorization and an improvement of the weatherization assistance program. I co-founded the Congressional Electrification Caucus, which will promote EVs, heat pumps, and fossil fuel powered equipment um, to go to electrification. We've done a lot of work with electric uh, vehicles and we've put together a master plan, a climate bill that is being used as our template as the chair of the subcommittee on environment and climate We've made certain we've collected all the information in the caucus, various proposals made by members, and made certain that as we put that together, we would get 218 votes and that we could get it through the Senate. Otherwise, what I've seen in those very difficult four years during the Trump administration, standing still meant we went backward. We can't repeat that scenario. So it's important for us to make certain that we achieve these results, being science based, evidence based, with the 218 votes we require. Thank you, Paul. Rostislav, I will repeat the question. Climate change is a huge threat to the world's population. What solutions would you support to make a significant difference? Thank you for that question. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanna say that while Mr. Tonko talks about a lot of the things that he has done, there are a lot of things more that he should be doing. As the chair of the subcommittee on the environment and climate change, he has not sponsored the following bills. Environmental Justice for All Act, that has 103 sponsors in the House. He's not one of them. The Green New Deal for Public Schools Act and the Green New Deal, that's 70 sponsors. Not, he, he's not a sponsor on that. The End Polluter Welfare Act, the Civilian Climate Corps Act, B Big Oil Windfall Profit Tax Act, F Fossil Free Finance Act, Green New Deal for Cities Act. There's so, many, so much progressive transformational legislation that is uh, in Mr. Tonko's committee that he's simply not sponsoring. What is my priority? How would I address this crisis? I would introduce, <laughs> I would support the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is a transformational proposal. It's going to change the way uh, our economy functions. We need a unprecedented investment in the green economy that we haven't seen since the time of World War II. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act that has just recently passed is not nearly enough to stop the, the climate crisis, and it has a lot of internal problems with it. So this is, this is the core of our campaign. The core of our campaign is having a bold strategy on climate and making sure that our children, our grandchildren, and all the people who will one day inhabit this earth, that we are protecting their lives. Thank you. Before we continue, I would just like to once again go over um, what you both agreed to um, in our opening instructions. Um, instead of, please don't waste valuable time tearing down or labeling your opponent, to instead take this opportunity to let voters know your stance on a topic and how you propose to address the issues facing um, the people that you represent. Okay, second question, Rostislav, you get to go first this time for this one, and it is, um, to what extent should the United States take human rights violations into consideration as a condition of providing financial support to other countries? Thank you for that question. So to a very large extent, um, we should, we, we, our country is providing financial support to countries that are abusing human rights all over the world. Saudi Arabia is one example where we are actually providing weapons that are used to kill Somalis. Israel is another example where we are providing financing for a military machine that is occupying Palestinian territories. Um, the, the examples go on and on. Uh, so yes, if, if a country is abusing human rights, that is a disqualifying factor in providing any financial support, especially military support. On this same uh, topic, I would like to note, however, that I do support strong protection and support for U Ukraine. In, in the case of Ukraine, even though many people have argued that we shouldn't be providing weapons, it is absolutely necessary because Ukrainians aren't just fighting for their country, they're fighting for the future of Europe and the countries in that region. Putin isn't going to stop with Ukraine. He's going to go 
and attack Moldova and Georgia if Ukraine falls. And therefore, we have to make sure that we are supporting Ukraine and making sure that we are protecting that country. But um, other, in, in cases where human rights are an issue, which is not an issue in Ukraine, we need to stop providing financial support. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Human rights is a, uh, is a measurement that uh, ought to speak very boldly uh, to our interaction with nations. Uh, certainly uh, making uh, every effort to uh, uh, provide fairness and justice uh, as we attempt to do that in, in our given democracy, making certain we build upon our rights. I think that partnership is very important. Um, and certainly in the area of Ukraine, uh, that becomes very evident. We saw the uh, uh, treatment of so many, uh, so many lives were at risk because of the, uh, uh, the occupation that, that, that Putin has, that, that uh, obsession he has with destroying their nation and their people. And so uh, I've been proud to uh, support in many, many situations over the last months, efforts that will assist Ukraine in their fight against Putin. Uh, I agree that as a petrol dictator, he is one who's very interested in taking over other nations. He won't stop at Ukraine. So I think it's important for us to make a statement about human rights and for us to make a statement about defending Ukraine that uh, is fighting so boldly and uh, admirably for their, for their democracy. Uh, it's instructive to all of us to understand their passion to fight for their freedom and their democracy. Thank you. Paul, then you get to go first next. Um, here's the next question. Would you agree that a woman's right to choose is a fundamental human right? And if so, what steps would you take to protect this right? Sure. You know, we look at the, uh, the latest actions by a radical Republican Supreme Court, and I might suggest that uh, it, uh, it, the Supreme Court has pretty much always been seen as, as a political, but of late, I think it's been very partisan. And the latest re uh, action by the justices in their majority to deny Roe v. Wade to go forward, uh, we need to make certain we make a statement. It's why I supported the Women's Health Protection Act, which was recently uh, uh, put through uh, the House. Uh, I think it's so important for us to etch into statute uh, the, uh, the spirit of Roe v. Wade to protect uh, a woman, to make choices in what are very important and difficult uh, uh, settings. They have uh, obviously to work with their family, their medical team, their God, uh, and make those decisions in a very personalized way. So it's important for us to protect that. We're also making certain that as we pass the Ensuring Access to Abortion Act, they were not um, uh, obstructed from services uh, simply because they were going from one state traveling to another, and then also making certain that access to contraception uh, would be another area that we're going to review because of the murmurings. Of, of the Supreme Court uh, that they will be taking additional action as they go forward. So these are important steps for us now to follow these devastating decisions to make certain that we etch into statute those uh, priorities and those abilities. Thank you, thank you. And Rostislav, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, that, that's not gonna be necessary. Okay. For First of all, I'd like to say that uh, women are not the only people who can bear children. I'm not saying that as a political statement, uh, just to be accurate. Um, Supreme Court reform is absolutely necessary. We have to uh, have term limits within the Supreme Court. Um, there's actually a really good bill that does that. Um, I would hope that uh, my opponent would like to uh, would like to sponsor it because I, I checked and he hasn't yet. Um, there needs to be ethics reforms in, uh, in the Supreme Court. We also need to limit their jurisdiction over certain issues. Uh, this could be one of the issues where we can limit their jurisdiction. I also like AOC's proposal. AOC has proposed that we should open up abortion clinics on federal land to make them easily accessible. I support that. Um, we have to provide transportation uh, for people to be able to uh, go to abortion sites. We have to make sure that uh, abortion pills are readily available and free for people who might require uh, abortions. So there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that we can address this issue. Um, 
And uh, again, it, although it starts with the Supreme Court, there's a lot of really practical approaches that can be done on the ground in real time. Thank you. Thank you. And Rostislav, you're up next for the you're up for the next question. How would you address the problem of residents, often low income, living near incinerators, specifically the Saratoga sites? public housing complex located near the Norlite hazardous waste incinerator? Yes, so thank you so much for that question, whoever asked this. This is a hazard to the community. It's been going on for decades. For those who do not know that Norlite hazardous waste incinerator is a very dangerous facility that burns hazardous waste and pollutes the communities around it. Uh, this has been going on for years and years. They've had so many violations. There have been incidents of lung cancer, other diseases in the vicinity, and it's, it's, it needs to be shut down. What I, what I am advocating for is to take that property by eminent domain and to turn it, clean it up, turn it into a public park. Residents shouldn't have to move away from a hazardous facility. It's the hazardous facility that's the problem, not public housing. We, we have a crisis right now in this country where we don't have enough public housing. So if every time we, put, we have public housing next to a hazardous facility, the public housing has to move, what kind of a country is that? So we have to shut down the Norlite hazardous waste incinerator. There are also other parts where environment is really important in our community that I wanna address. The Port of Freeman's expansion project, we need to stop that. We need to also protect the Pine Bush Preserve uh, there's a lot of development that need not be happening there. And finally, the Troy Waterfront. There's an old quarry that Native Americans used to use. It's the last part of Troy Waterfront that is truly wild. We have to protect it. We have to protect the environment in our own district, not just at the federal level. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, would you like me to repeat the question? It was a long uh, sure. one. Sure, please, if you would, please. Sure. How would you address the problem of residents, often low income, living near incinerators, specifically the Saratoga Sites Public Housing Complex, located near the Norlite Hazardous Waste Incinerator? Sure. Well, absolutely everyone deserves to live in, in an area that is publicly safe and publicly healthy. And uh, I'm very familiar with the issue. I've worked very closely with the city of Cohoes and with state and federal agencies in this regard. I appreciate and respect the leadership of, of the mayor of Cohoes. He has done a tremendous job of pushing the agencies and working with our office. We have uh, advanced uh, all sorts of efforts to make certain that there is strict attention paid here, uh, making certain that uh, they were reviewing the site and the, uh, the pollution of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the impact to the community, to the neighborhood. I have also worked the Department of Defense hard to make certain that PFOS is not incinerated at that site. We've been very strict in our efforts, in our approach with the agency because I think it's detrimental. So we are very much in favor of helping the community in this regard, working with the state DEC, working with the federal EPA, working with the DOD, uh, Department of Defense, to make certain that all is done here to protect the residents, to make certain that they have a publicly healthy, publicly safe location. Uh, we, again, uh, cherish working with the, uh, the community, with Cohoes, uh, and I think that, um, you know, it's an exercise where local permitting and local standards and environmental review and permitting become very essential and very important. It's why we have these restrictive measures, I think, Thank to guide you. us. Thank you. So Paul, you're next up for the next question. Um, what would you do as a member of Congress to address inflation since this crisis impacts everyone in the capital region? Well, there have been a number of things that we've been working on. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the price gouging measure uh, for the, uh, the pain at the pump. Uh, we have been very active in putting that legislation together and getting it passed, making certain that wherever there's exploitation to um, impact the consumer, to make profits because you lost them in the pandemic as a fossil fuel industry, uh, we're not going to allow you to get away with that um, in, if you're gouging the public. 
But beyond that, I think the way to uh, address inflation also comes with the Inflation Reduction Act, which will put a lot of investment into um, our, our climate change effort that will put people to work, which I think is very important. It will address uh, reducing the cost of pharmaceuticals, which will be very helpful in an inflationary uh, spiral. And we also work with the CHIPS Act to make certain that we deliver chips to, um, to a standard now that will be produced as they were in the 1990s, where nearly 40% of the world's chips were made in the US. We're down to some 12%. So the CHIPS Act will enable us to be more dependent, uh, independent uh, of, uh, for our needs and making certain that we'll produce locally the chips we need that are in our phone, in our vehicles, in our uh, toasters, in our coffee makers. It, it affects every appliance, every aspect of our life. Putting that into play is important. Chips for the auto industry is going to help us in a big way. About a third of inflation is driven by the auto industry. They have had mm -hmm. automobiles manufactured sitting on the lot because they don't have chips. Thank so you. this will relieve that tremendously. Thank you. Thank you. Rostislav, um, what would you do as a member of Congress to address inflation since this crisis impacts everyone in the capital region? So this is a grassroots campaign. And what this what be, running a grassroots campaign means is that I've spent a lot of time walking through the community and talking to people. Uh, I spent a lot of time, especially in low income communities where I've met people who are really struggling with inflation. I've met people who can no longer afford to buy groceries and have to eat frozen food for dinner because they, they just don't have the money to do that. I've met people who have had to sell the cars because they can't afford the price of gas. Inflation is really, really painful for the American, uh, for, all, for all Americans, but especially the ones who are the lowest income uh, threshold. So uh, how do we address inflation? There's a lot of ways. Number one, we need to fully fund Section 8 housing so people are not waiting in line for years in order to get affordable housing. We have to fully fund heat so that uh, people can easily access energy, cooling, and heating. We have to make sure that we have a nationwide program for rent stabilization. That means that rent has to be controlled at a certain amount and cannot increase beyond a certain amount for any uh, residents in the United States. That's not just a local issue, that's a global issue. Uh, universal basic income is another transformational proposal. That means that every American citizens would get a certain amount of money every month or every year uh, in order to support their, uh, their lifestyle, regardless of how much money they have. Why is this important? Because a lot of our welfare programs provide really bad incentives. And finally, a federal jobs guarantee would go a long way. Thank you. Okay, Rostislav, you get the next question. What will you do to improve bipartisan efforts to address the country's challenges, particularly in the event of a GOP majority in the House next year? Can, can you repeat that question, please? Sure. What will you do to improve bipartisan efforts to address the country's challenges particularly in the event of a GOP majority in the House next year? Yeah, so, well, first of all, you know, the biggest challenge that is facing this country is climate change. Uh, it's the biggest challenge facing the entire world. Uh, if uh, the Republicans take over Congress, uh, I don't see how we can make progress on this issue. I don't see how the Green New Deal can happen if Republicans take over Congress. So we have to First of all, make sure that the GOP doesn't take over the U.S. House of Representatives or their Senate. I trust that regardless whether uh, Mr. Tonko or myself will prevail in this, uh, in this primary, we will come together and uh, make sure that we support uh, whoever is the Democratic Party nominee in taking on Liz Joy, who is a dangerous person for this country, to, for this uh, community to send to Congress. Um, but um, I do believe that there is room. There is room to listen to the other side. There is room to listen with empathy and compassion to understand where they're coming from. And there is room to educate. My view of what it means to be a legislator is that you have to be an educator first. That means you have to 
be a vocal advocate for the bills that you believe in, but then you also have to use this new world of social media in order to get out there and let many people all over the country and all over the world uh, build those coalitions which are going to push legislation like the Green New Deal forward. Um, that is the role of legislators. That is what I want to see every legislator, including my opponent, be doing is using social media, using media in order to get out there and push for those transformative progressive legislations to save this planet. Thank you. Paul? Sure. What, what okay, yeah, you, if you would, if you would repeat sure, it, please. Sure. What will you do to improve bipartisan efforts to address the country's challenges, particularly in the event of a GOP majority in the House next year? Thank you. So the question is providing the scenario that it is a Republican majority. Um, I'll do what, I'll continue to do what I have been doing as a member of the majority. I've reached across the aisle uh, to members in the minority party, um, especially those on energy and commerce, to have either breakfast, dinner, um, or dinner, uh, and to gather together just one-on-one, -on -one, uh, no staff or no multi-members of one party against one or two of the other. One-on-one -on -one conversation, building relationships, which I think are the key to a success in many, many professions, certainly in this profession. It's about relationships, developing trust, developing a, a working partnership. Um, so I've done dinners with many, men for my, many of my colleagues, many, many members of Congress, and we've been able to uh, talk about districts and define those districts for each other better, talk about our goals, talk about our accomplishments, what got us there, what are our, dri what are our drives to, uh, uh, to come to DC and what is it about? What do we want to accomplish? That creates a great good mechanism for by which we can um, uh, learn from each other. I did that with the ranker on my subcommittee, David McKinley from West Virginia. We went to each other's districts to better understand, you know, what the concerns are in those districts, especially as it relates to climate and how we begin to do the transformational pieces, which are so important to our planet. But it begins with one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And, um, and partnerships and relationships that are deepened by that kind of personal experience. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. The red and, card, please. Oh, yep. Yep. Uh, red, thank you. So, Paul, Mr. Just, just one second, make sure the timers have time to start timing you so you get all your time. Ready? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So Mr. Tonko, um, I, I respect you and you talk a lot about uh, ne negotiating, talking to people on the other side of the aisle. So I want to make you an offer. This is, here's the offer. I will drop out of this race and endorse your candidacy right now if you commit to the following. Commit to signing on and vocally advocating for all bills that are supported by the majority of the Progressive Caucus. Commit to no longer accept any money from any corporate political action committee and lobbyists. Commit to introduce and vocally advocate for a bill that will take the Norlite hazardous waste incinerator by eminent domain, clean it up and turn it into a public park, and a bill that would end the Queemans Port expansion project and all development in the Pine Bush Preserve. Commit to purchasing a house in this district and moving here. Lastly, commit to introducing legislation that will make sure that anyone who is an immigrant in this country, regardless of status, after five years will be able to uh, apply for citizenship. Um, I, if you agree to these and want to engage in a, a public negotiation around their parameters, I will drop out of this race, fully endorse and support your candidacy. The ball Thank is you. in your court. Thank you. So, Paul, if you if you want to respond, you're going to have to use your red card. No, I'd rather not use my red card right now. Thank you. Okay. All righty then. Um, let's see. So, Paul, you're up next. What is your position on the use of defunct power plants in upstate New York as mining, and that's in quotes, mining centers for cryptocurrency? Yeah, there's been a lot of, um, of focus on, these, uh, on the cryptocurrency issue. And um, obviously our committee will be holding hearings uh, because it's a rather new element that's being brought to the attention of the country and certainly to upstate New York. I think we need to make certain that we have all the facts at our fingertips. It's a new emerging concept. It's one that could be very, uh, uh, we have to be cautious to make certain that the environment is protected, that we don't go down a road that undoes progress, 
that we're making, uh, to make certain that we're uh, greening up our planet Earth, and to make certain that uh, we know all of the dynamics. Uh, it's a major step. We'll have thorough hearings. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, both Energy and Commerce, um, as a standing committee, and the subcommittees on Energy and the subcommittee on Environment and Climate will all be taking their stab at those hearings to make certain that all the information is there, that we're doing it in a science-based academic uh, setting that will uh, garner the best results. Thank you. Okay, Rostislav, um, what is your position on the use of defunct power plants in upstate New York as mining centers for cryptocurrency? Yeah, well, um, cryptocurrency is not really a new issue, at least as far as I'm concerned. It's been around for at least a decade, probably more. Um, cryptocurrency uh, mining is a real problem for the environment because what happens is when, when you mine cryptocurrency, you lose you use a ton of power. And um, you know, I think I think the statistics show that something like if you take the entire energy footprint of just cryptocurrency mining, they produce uh, they use the same amount of power that a country the size of Norway is using, and that is just keeps increasing. So um, I I really don't think that we should we should be uh, considering in any way shape or form supporting more cryptocurrency mining, especially in New York. Um, that I think that is really offensive to to the environment. Uh, for, furthermore, um, cryptocurrency is is uh, kind of a dangerous dangerous concept. Uh, a lot of a lot of people ha can lose a lot of money very quickly through uh, unhealthy unhealthy bets, through making uh, uh, investment decisions that are poorly informed. And so, uh, I, although I'm not in favor of banning cryptocurrency, I don't think we should be in any way incentivizing it. There's a lot of things we can do in defunct power plants uh, that does not involve uh, cryptocurrency mining. So that's my position on that. Thank you. And you're up for the next question. It's a long one. What do you believe the government's role should be in healthcare? And how do you feel we should protect people from crushing medical debt? such as Medicare for All, Public Option, ACA Expansion, none of the above. Would you like me to repeat it? Uh, no, uh, that's okay. I'm okay. ready. So first of all, we have to forgive medical debt. Um, medical debt is a crushing burden, again, for the poorest of the poor. Um, but even not just, just the poorest of the poor, I personally have struggled with a lot of medical debt. I've had to forego my own medical treatments because I could not afford uh, to pay for pills that would uh, stop uh, some of the stomach issues that I've been having. So uh, th this, this is a, a really, really um, a big issue for so many Americans. Uh, we have to have universal health care. Uh, there's many ways to do it. I think uh, Medicare for all, the Bernie Sanders proposal is the one that uh, it is going to carry the day because it is the most common sense uh, and simplest to implement. But I think that uh, I would be, uh, I would want to consider every single proposal on that as well. Uh, so, so yeah, universal health care, medical debt forgiveness, those are the types of policies that are going to uh, protect the people who need uh, that protection most, going to help uh, our country uh, create more equality. Because at the end of the day, uh, what our platform is about is environment, equality, and education. And unless we can uh, do these things, we're not, we're going to continue to have a society that is becoming more and more unequal, a society where the top 1% are, owes as much wealth as 90, the bottom 90% of the country. So we have to uh, stop that somewhere and, and make sure that everybody's lifted up. Thank you. Okay, Paul, I'm going to repeat it. Okay. What do you believe the government's role should be in healthcare? And how do you feel we should protect people from crushing medical debt, such as Medicare for all, public option, ACA expansion, none of the above? Okay, interesting. The question is uh, pretty much uh, highlighting my track record. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, marked a major step that I was 
part of when I first entered Congress. I supported the legislation because it really uh, came out against uh, the discrimination against those who had pre-existing conditions. So those people have been benefited greatly. We've also allowed more than 20 million to receive health care for the first time. I also had uh, taken a major step uh, with the Medicare for All uh, legislation. It was the first bill that I ever co-sponsored as I entered Congress. Uh, and right now I'm pleased that we were able to uh, beef up the Affordable Care Act tax credits through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which I think will be very helpful in uh, saving people perhaps as much as $800 uh, with those premiums. We've also allowed uh, Medicare to, in that bill, to negotiate for the first time drug prices, which will be very beneficial across the board. We even put a cap of $35 on the insulin uh, cost. Uh, many are spending as much as 600 to 800 a month. So that will be beneficial. It creates a new $2,000 cap on out-of-pocket expenditures by our Medicare eligibles. So uh, for, for any year and also, um, you know, worked very hard. Uh, I thought it was important to have a public option so that it could uh, in encourage the uh, market uh, uh, competitiveness. So all of these are uh, part of my track record and uh, appreciate the question. Thank you. Okay, then you're up next for the, for the next question. What is your opinion of the government's role concerning sexual orientation, same-sex marriage, and interracial marriages? Right. In fact, um, we heard some of those uh, rumors coming from the, uh, some, from the Supreme Court after the devastating Roe v. Wade uh, uh, turnabout. It, um, it's important. I have supported it in my career, uh, uh, marriage equality, um, at the state level, in the state assembly, and now in the House of Representatives. Uh, we're also making certain that uh, we, again, ensure human rights by... Um, providing for the Respect for Marriage Act, which was recently done, to again, follow that, that um, messaging coming from the, uh, uh, from the highest court in the land, making certain that we statutorily protect those opportunities, which include certainly um, uh, race and gender in the Marriage Equality, the Respect for Marriage Act. So um, I think it's important by that legislation alone, I make a statement, I answer your question simply by the work I have done and the legislation I have supported. Um, and I think it's important for us to do this in light of the Supreme Court, which is uh, you know, really taking a lot of progress made over the last decades and, and disregarding that, disrespecting it, and turning those results around. Thank you. Rostislav, um, what is your opinion of the government's role concerning sexual orientation same-sex marriage, and interracial marriages? So um, there, there are some parts of our lives with, where the government needs to stay out of. The government needs to stay out of the kind of medical decisions that we uh, make between ourselves and our doctors. It needs to stay out of um, the decisions when librarians are deciding what kind of books to put on their school shelves, what kind of decisions those uh, they make. Um, what kind, of, uh, what kind of treatment we wanna have when we are talking to a mental health care professionals. There's a lot of spaces where a government doesn't have a place. Um, so, you know, Republicans keep bringing this, bringing this up as a wedge issue. They think that it's going to split the Democrats, but, but I don't think uh, that this is a wedge issue. I don't, I don't think that this is going to split the Democrats. This is uh, an issue where the Democratic party, I believe is united. Um, you know, I, I also support everything that Paul Tonko said. I also support the Equality Act. We have to help the LGBTQ plus community in every way possible. And I will say that Paul Tonko has a really strong record on this issue, and I support his record on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you are up next, Ross, for the next question. A Princeton study in 2014 showed that average citizens have virtually no influence over bills in Congress, while the economic elite have a significant impact. How would you rectify this situation? This is why I'm running. Uh, so my experience is that I was uh, assembly aide for six years uh, to an assembly member from Brooklyn. Um, 
And I, I, I saw things that honestly are, were very disheartening. I, I've seen uh, politicians walk out of meetings with lobbyists and ask, you know, how much money is that person paying me? I've seen lobbyists openly talk about how much money uh, they should be paying to politicians in order to achieve their policy priorities. Um, and believe me that for every single time that that was said openly, it was thought. We have a system of institutionalized corruption. We have uh, centrist Democrats and Republicans accepting large amounts of money from every industry imaginable and doing their bidding. Um, and it, you know, it, it almost, it's almost as though uh, in order to be a establishment politician, you now have to uh, say one thing, but also know how to take money from the right industries. Um, th this is unacceptable and it cannot continue. That's why I will not accept any money from PACs. I will not accept any money from corporate lobbyists. This campaign has been raised and funded by small donations from people. And that is the way that we will continue. That is the way forward. Because if we allow big money to have an influence over our politics and over our decisions, we will never be able to solve issues like climate change because every time we will fill up our gas tank, we'll be paying a lobbyist to go influence another politician in Washington, DC. Thank you. Paul, I'll repeat the question. A Princeton study in 2014 showed that average citizens have virtually no influence over bills in Congress while the economic elite have a significant impact. How would you rectify this situation? Well, I think the, uh, the caucus has labeled this the highest priority. Simply, if you look at HR1, uh, the House uh, of Representatives bill number one, which indicates that prioritization is for the People's Act. And um, the historic legislation uh, would take a number of steps to get big money out of politics and restore power to the people. First, it would require disclosures uh, on online political ads uh, and require all organizations to um, disclose their large donors. Uh, this leg legislation would also give more power to everyday Americans by providing for matching of small donations. Uh, that would allow for citizens to have a more vital involvement uh, in, their, uh, in the public discourse. And finally, this bill would ensure that um, that there are effective cops on that campaign finance beat, if you will, that would uh, provide for the strengthening of rules on so-called super PACs and empowering the Federal Elections Commission to enforce the laws on the books. I think all of this is a high priority. We have made it our case. We've sent it to, to the Senate. But um, again, I think if we're going to get a lot of these reforms done, if we're going to stop some of the negative uh, responses from the Supreme Court, we're going to have to elect more senators, Democratic senators to the U.S. Senate to undo the filibuster and then to make certain that we grow the majority in the House. These are very critical times. Our democracy is at risk. And I think this would strengthen our democracy, the H.R. 1 legislation. Thank you. And Rostislav would like to use his red card. So timers, are you ready for that? Yes, they're all set. Go ahead. Those reforms are not nearly enough. Uh, what we need is a complete uh, reform of the campaign finance law. We need complete public financing of campaigns. New York City has already taken steps in that direction. Now we need to make steps in that direction as a country. Throughout this whole campaign, you know, I've had to run it with, with basically nothing. We've had to uh, figure out how to make volunteers, uh, how to involve volunteers, how to run it off of small donation. That's extremely difficult. There's not an even playing field in this country. Whenever you're running against an incumbent, you're running against big money, you're running against millions of dollars. And uh, frankly, a lot of people have said, you cannot beat Paul Tonko without raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this is um, an issue where we need an equal playing field between candidates because an equal playing field will allow voters to choose the better candidate, not just the candidate who has more money, who's better funded, and who has better, uh, who is able to spend that money on better consultants and people to knock on doors. Thank you. Alida, might I use my red card yes. also? Yes, yeah. Paul is going to use the red that... card. Go ahead. Thank you. I think that uh, it's important to make certain that we do the reforms that we can achieve. I think HR1 goes major steps forward. 
And also, you know, there's been mention made of uh, taking money from fossil fuel industries. You know, I think it needs to be straightforwardly shared with the public. That includes a, a good part of that is convenience stores and truck stops, which are small businesses in the district that I represent. They host a lot of jobs for people. They provide convenience for neighborhoods and quality of life enhancement. I think that, um, you know, again, we have to be very clear to the people about the charges being made about this. And I think that if there's anything that should guide us in these campaigns and in public service is trust, an element of trust. And you gain that by being straightforward and credible uh, with the, uh, the sharing with the public. And so I think it's important for us to uh, understand that, um, you know, a lot of these situations, the measurements that are made will include situations like these convenience stores that I think are very strong small businesses in the district that I represent. Thank you. Hey, this is going to be the final question. And Paul, you're up first for this. How will the infrastructure- Was I, was I up first for the last question or? Uh, I have you up first okay. for this, but I, you know what? I could have made a mistake. And I, I apologize don't remember if I did. If, if he went first or I went first on the last question. Yeah, I think, by I my think, grid. I think Mr. Rar closed on the second question, on that question, he was second, okay. I believe. Okay, well then we'll let Rostislav go next. Thank you. How will the in? Okay. So I, I, I believe I used the red card, and then Paul, uh, Mr. Tonko used the red card. So he spoke second on that question. Yeah. So does that mean that he speaks first now, or he speaks second? The red cards have nothing to do with the order. No, no, I know, but but oh. I was the first one to use a red card. Which, but anyway, I, I can answer it first. That's not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being gracious. Here we go. How will the infrastructure bill of 2021 help to preserve farmland and promote better air and water quality in New York? Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. How will the infrastructure bill of 2021 help to preserve farmland and promote better air and water quality in New York? Right. Thank you for that question. Um, well, I, I wasn't in Congress. I, I didn't vote on the infrastructure bill of 2021. I, I'm not uh, someone who, who knows too much about it. But what I will say is this. Um, we need to support uh, our uh, food ecosystem. We have a, a problem with large, uh, large manufacturers of whether it's meat or produce, uh, monoculture, the, the, these are these are big issues. You know, I I am someone who's uh, grew up in Russia. I lived in Japan and Germany. Um, I have a very international perspective on these issues. In Japan and France, for example, people the government really takes a very active role in helping uh, individual farmers uh, and families uh, and families sustain themselves and 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 produce like for example example, those beautiful cheeses and wines that we, we get from there. That wouldn't happen without government involvement in, uh, in helping those mom and pop far farming families. So that's, that's something that I would like to see here. I want to see a real diverse diversity, uh, a, a, a diverse food ecosystem um, being built all over our country and, and especially in New York. Um, so, so that, that would be my approach. And, and by the way, whenever we uh, address it in this way, that is how we protect our air, our water, our environment. Because these, when we are not relying on monoculture, when we are planting things that work uh, together, we don't need to use all those pesticides. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Paul. How will the infrastructure bill of 2021 help to preserve farmland and promote better air and water quality in New York? Uh, absolutely, it's holistic in nature, in its design. It uh, will not only address roads and bridges, but obviously water systems, both wastewater and um, drinking water, uh, which will be a huge benefit to uh, clean water. Uh, $15 billion that's included for lead pipe removal which will uh, make certain that no child, no family is drinking from lead infested pipes. Uh, we know that the damage there is irreversible. Uh, we know that there's a lot of ag components in the infrastructure bill 
that will enable them to not only be more uh, environmentally sound, but also more productive with crop cover and all that will go towards uh, decarbonization. A number of methods, uh, methods in the bill, uh, opportunities, dollars, investments that will go towards the decarbonization in the agriculture industry in terms of the air uh, that we breathe. Obviously, um, the local um, uh, impact here with offshore wind, which I see us becoming an epicenter for that industry for the Eastern Seaboard. You know, we'll be manufacturing the foundations, the towers, and hopefully the fins, the blades for the uh, offshore wind that will allow us to do uh, a great reduction in pollution, making certain that uh, we go forward with a, a very sound uh, bit of activity. Um, so I think that uh, this will provide jobs, it will harden our infrastructure, it will prevent erosion, and it will prevent uh, flooding, uh, which is very critical when it comes to protecting our farmland, and uh, certainly provide us cleaner drinking water and uh, safer, cleaner air to breathe. Um, I think that it's a great investment in creating union jobs, which are very important. So it's taking care Thank of essential you. projects and providing for great work opportunity. Thank you. So it's now time for the closing statements. And um, just to let you know, you have no more than one minute to, um, for your closing statement. And so to reverse the order of the opening, Paul, you would be first for your closing statement. Thank you so much. Again, let me thank the league for the opportunity and uh, Mr. Rar for the opportunity to exchange ideas. I think that um, certainly having work in this area in both the state and federal capacity, uh, I've developed a relationship with so many uh, individuals, constituents, businesses, industries that enable us to really speak to job creation. This is still about strengthening our economy, reducing inflation. We've done a lot of work in this session of Congress. We've made certain that there was an American rescue plan that assisted local governments with essential services, got shots in the arms, made certain the doors of business remained open, that the arts community was uh, uh, underpinned uh, so that they can continue their uh, effect on the community with with jobs and the effervescence of the arts. It is also about making certain that we pass the infrastructure bill in bipartisan fashion that enables us to take the $1.2 trillion worth of activity and put it into meaningful projects that have been backburnered for far too long. Safer roads, safer bridges, uh, sounder water supplies, broadband, that is the essential. So uh, I look forward to this opportunity to return to office. Thank you. Ross, you're up. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Throughout this entire campaign, uh, I've been told again, again, and again that we cannot beat Paul Tonko. They said that he has more money, more staff, more resources, more everything. But none of that matters because on this stage here, face to face, we had this discussion. And the voters saw clearly who the better candidate is. Even though our democracy is unfair, even though it skews the playing field in favor of the wealthy, the powerful, and the entrenched, our democracy, I believe, still has resources within it for you to make a difference. And on election day, on August 23rd, it's not going to matter one bit how much money Mr. Tonko has. All that's going to matter is whether you come out to vote and whether you share this debate. Thank you. I just want to remind the audience uh, that primary voting day is August 23rd and um, early voting is going on right now. That will end on August 21. The New York state is a closed primary state. So you could check with your local county board of elections to see if you're eligible to vote in the primary if you're unsure of that. I want to thank both of the candidates for spending time um, attending this event and helping to educate the voters. And I wanna thank our audience who will view this recording for taking the time to learn about the candidates and good afternoon.